Greetings everyone, I'm Mar, and once again this is my opinion. Following the 1923 discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb, Egypt mania swept the world. People were captivated by the artifacts that adorned the boy king's untouched tomb, as well as Tut's golden death mask. The fascination turned morbid once members of the expedition began dying. Now known to be the result of mold and tragic timing, contemporary stories of the mummy's curse made for sensational reading. It's no wonder Universal took the plunge. Released on the heels of Dracula and Frankenstein, The Mummy is a 1932 horror film starring Boris Karloff as the titular monster. While not a literary adaptation like the previous two, it bears some resemblance to The Ring of Thoth. How much is a video for another time? Originally centered around the Italian charlatan and prophet Cagliostro, the references and setting were reshuffled in order to capitalize on Egypt mania. Set in then contemporary Egypt, the film centers around the resurrection and goals of the titular character, Imhotep. A high priest, Imhotep was condemned for attempting to resurrect Princess Anaxanamun using the Scroll of Thoth. General blasphemy, it was amplified given Imhotep's position and his feelings for the princess. Imhotep's sarcophagus and the scroll were secretly buried, only to be rediscovered by modern-day archaeologists. One has the misfortune of being seated during the mummy's resurrection. Subtle and lacking the flash of later films, what makes it work is Bramwell Fletcher's performance. Fletcher's inflections sell that he's been driven insane. A decade later, Imhotep, no longer in mummy garb and under the alias of Ardith Bay, which is an anagram of Death by Ra, helps a new team of archaeologists uncover Anaxanamun's tomb. His love remaining, Imhotep attempts to resurrect the princess, only to discover her soul already reincarnated. Coincidentally, said reincarnation is friends with the members of the archaeology team, so it doesn't take Imhotep long to discover her. Now it's a race between team and mummy, with the princess's modern soul at stake. There are numerous parallels to Dracula, and given how close the release dates are, it's likely not coincidental. Both open with the Swan Lake music playing across the credits. The first act setting is the monster's homeland before shifting to a contemporary setting thereafter. The monster's eyes are focused on during close-up shots. Edward Van Sloan plays the main adversary, Van Helsing and Dracula, Dr. Muller here. Backstory aside, from an acting and writing standpoint, they might as well be the same character. Van Sloan brings the same presence and vocal intensity to both roles. David Manners also plays the human love interest. The female lead also feels invigorated after encountering the titular monster. The difference here is specifics and denouement. Carl Freud worked on both films. The cinematographer for Dracula, he was promoted to director for The Mummy, allowing for a continuity between Universal features. He did excellent work here. Mastermind behind the Universal monster look and grandfather of modern day makeup artistry, Jack Pierce's skills are on full display. Following the success with Frankenstein, it was logical for Pierce to continue here especially with Karloff in the titular role. Karloff's face was perfect to work from, his features begging to be accentuated. It took Jack Pierce eight hours to get Karloff into the bandages for the opening scene. While only shown here and in marketing material, Pierce's traditional money design is respectful of the culture while being creatively original. Even though it took Pierce eight hours, it wasn't required due to the use of a dummy for the long shots and camera angles. Karloff supposedly quipped, Well, you've done a wonderful job, but you've forgotten to give me a fly. The mummy design isn't shown clearly, the camera focusing primarily on Karloff's face and hands. Less is more at its finest. Perfect way to build suspense the old-fashioned way. The wrinkles Karloff shows off throughout are a simple yet time-consuming effect using collodion and cotton. Collodion in small doses is not the nicest substance to work with, so Karloff deserves a round of applause for constantly having globs applied. The wrinkles not only betray Imhotep's age, but imply that with time, bandages have become one with his face. The period costumes look great. Simple compared to what later entries would show, here they sell the flashbacks due to Freund's black and white blocking. It might have worked, but it would have looked strange in color. The flashbacks were originally longer showing Helen's reincarnations throughout the centuries, from Rome 
to the mighty Norseman. For the latter, actress Zita Johan supposedly was placed too close to the lions by director Carl Freund. The longer scene was deleted for time and pacing. While it most likely has been lost, if rediscovered, I'd love to see the scene. Perhaps the cut was justified, but maybe it could have added additional depth. Karloff commands every second of this film. While his presence isn't as theatrical as Lugosi's, he's just as charming and able to convey power and emotion with just a glance. It's while his eyes are focused on during the infamous close-ups, amplified by the profile of Karloff's face and subtle movements. Given how little Karloff spoke in previous films, it's nice to see him give an excellent dialogue to act out. Having watched it for the first time in several years, it's no wonder he became a huge star throughout the 30s. Karloff's slight lisp adds to his charm, dry when conversing with the archaeologists and emotional when crossing through oceans of time. A real-life believer in the occult in reincarnation, Zita Johan was perfect casting for the role of Helen. Her pre-existing knowledge was the perfect role research for how to act while remembering and balancing personalities for the climax. A strong-willed woman, there was tension between Zita and director Carl Freund during the production. The two disliked each other, and Freud attempted to label Zita as hard to work with. Zita claimed Freud also wanted to use her as a scapegoat in case production fell behind schedule. While her statement makes for a good story, the Hayes Code not existing yet puts the validity into question. No matter the reason, given her onset treatment, I don't blame Zita for sticking to theater afterwards. The Mummy is a classic, carried by strong cinematography and the excellent performance of its lead. If you've only seen the recent Mummy films, it's a completely different animal. The pace is slower, allowing the mood, tension, and story to build to a natural climax. The ending is a literal deus ex machina, but fits given the nature of ancient Egypt. What better way for Emotep to meet his end than through an act of the gods and retaliation for his sacrilege? It also provides a story out for him not appearing in the sequels.